Citroen's classy, glassy, improved second generation Grand C4 Picasso aims to offer the most practical, the most versatile and the most elegant solution to families shopping in the seven seat compact MPV segment. It's a sector aimed at those who need either a big boot or the option to take more than five folk, but don't want the sheer size and expense of a large segment people carrier. If that's you, then you'll find that this now more efficient and sophisticated French contender takes care of the basics of space, safety and cost effectiveness with ease. But where this model really excels is in the other things, style, technology and a very emotive feel. By people carrying standards, it's a bit special. Buying a seven-seat MPV is usually an exercise in sacrifice. You accept the fact that in return for three seating rows, you'll get something boxy, boring and bland. Or will you? With this improved second-generation Grand C4 Picasso model, Citroen begged to differ on that score. The Picasso name has been synonymous with Citroen people carriers since the turn of the century and with seven seat MPVs since the first generation Grand C4 Picasso model was launched in 2006. That car tapped into the major growth area in this segment amongst buyers who really only needed five seats but wanted the occasional versatility of a couple of extra fold out chairs in the boot. This one makes that arrangement more usable, thanks to extra interior room that's been provided without the kind of excessive extra vehicle length the buyers in this sector don't want. This additional space comes courtesy of the class-leadingly long wheelbase conferred upon this car by a clever multi-patented EMP2 platform that's also claimed to sharpen up the handling. It all sounds very promising, particularly as these practical and dynamic virtues are clothed in what is arguably the most stylish shape ever to clothe, a family-minded MPV. Less futuristic at the original launch of this second generation model back in early 2014 was the relatively old tech engine range and media connectivity on offer. Both these things, though, have been brought up to date since, and this revised Grand C4 Picasso now claims to be as efficient and media savvy as any family buyer could want it to be. In prospect, then, what we have here is a very clever people carrier indeed, with a glassy, futuristic combination of high-tech style and efficient practicality that ought to set strong standards in this segment. Does it? Well, let's find out. Climb aboard a Grand C4 Picasso and before you even set off, it's clear that this is going to be a somewhat different experience. There are no conventional instrument dials and nothing directly in front of you, with key driving information instead displayed on a giant screen in the centre of the dash. The first thing that will probably grab your attention though is this, a windscreen that stretches up and almost over your head, affording a panoramic view, not just of the road ahead, but also the sky above. The wishbone shaped windscreen pillars have glazed centre sections to further boost visibility. And there's a low window line that not only makes manoeuvring easy, but should also give children a better view out and potentially stop them feeling sick. So, it's different to sit in then, but will it be so to drive? Let's find out. We should start by telling you what's changed engine-wise with this car as part of the model updates we're reviewing here. Ever since this model's original launch in early 2014, Citroen has been gradually phasing out the old, relatively inefficient 1.6-litre mainstream engines it used to offer in its cars, VTI and THP petrol units and EHDI diesels. To replace these, we've been given something much better, especially in the case of petrol power, that now handled entirely by a downsized 1.2-litre three-cylinder PureTech turbo unit that's available here in a single 130 brake horsepower guise. Despite this unit's downsized design, it's a far more willing power plant than the old 1.6 litre petrol engines ever were, with 230 newton metres of pulling power being enough to take you to 62 miles an hour in 10.8 seconds, en route to 125 miles an hour. 
Most Grand C4 Picasso buyers, though, will continue to want a diesel. All this model's black pump fueled options now use more efficient blue HDI technology. The majority of buyers will go for the 1.6 litre unit, offered with either 100 or 120 brake horsepower. You'll probably want to find the extra to get the Pokia power plant, which ups torque from 254 newton meters to 300 newton meters. Always a useful thing in any kind of people carrier. The blue HDI 120 variant makes 62 miles an hour from rest in 11.3 seconds, en route to 117 miles an hour, which is 1.4 seconds and 8 miles an hour quicker than its feebler counterpart. If you want more pulling power than that, Citroen continues to offer its 2-litre Blue HDI 150 engine, which, if you can afford it, is probably worth looking at with this 7-seat body style if you're regularly going to be taking on longer trips while carrying lots of luggage or using all three seating rows. This top version improves the performance figures to 9.7 seconds and 130 miles an hour. Provided you avoid the entry-level diesel engine, your dealer will offer you the option of semi-automatic EAT6 transmission as an alternative to the conventional six-speed manual stick shift. The EAT6 setup isn't a full auto, but a manual transmission without a clutch, which means that for smooth progress, you have to momentarily lift off between changes made via the steering wheel mounted paddle shifters. Until you learn to do that, the car will seem jerky and unresponsive, but once you adjust, the system actually works quite well and is certainly easier to use in the improved form fitted to this enhanced second generation design. Whatever transmission you choose though, one thing remains constant, the silky smooth ride. It's the thing we like most about this car. It may come as news to some motoring journalists, but the majority of MPV buyers don't routinely want to throw their cars about as if they were on a stage from the RAC rally. What most of them would prefer is a model that rolls the red carpet over the average appallingly surfaced British B-road, as this one does. Nothing in this part of the market can better the pillowy ride quality on offer here. But the trick, which Citroen hasn't always mastered, is to offer this without inducing the kind of body roll and handling wooliness that removes any element of enjoyment from the driving experience altogether. In this respect, it's certainly true that this impressively refined Grand C4 Picasso is a useful step forward from earlier Citroen MPVs. A light, stiff EMP2, or efficient modular platform, has shaved 140 kilograms off the curb weight of this second generation design, and that certainly helped in making the car feel more agile. But it's still some way off the sprightly standards of a rival Ford Grand C-Max, or even a Renault Grand Scenic, in terms of steering feel and body roll. And in true Citroen style, the brakes are quite heavily servo-assisted, reacting to the merest brush on the pedal. If you can ignore all of that, get familiar with the car and even start to push it a little through the corners, you'll find that the anchors are reassuringly effective, the steering's actually quite accurate, and the grip relatively plentiful. It's just getting to that point, something you probably won't manage on a brief test drive. In other words, don't be put off by initial unfamiliarities of design and drive. After all, you probably wouldn't be looking at this Citroen in the first place if you didn't want something just that little bit different from the usual character-free, compact people carrying experience. Just enjoy this car for what it is as you float over road imperfections, marvel at the unusually hushed levels of refinement, and enjoy the benefits of a commanding driving position that's a huge help at roundabouts or when parking, and with this panoramic screen makes it seem like you're suddenly viewing the world in high definition. Citroen is a brand with a heritage in design flair. You don't always find it, though, in the segments you'd expect. Over the last few years, some of this maker's conventional volume models have been, well, pretty conventional. So you might assume that the company's mainstream seven-seat people carrier would be much the same. As you can see, it isn't. 
A huge proportion of this vehicle's budget was lavished on aesthetics inside and out, with the result being a futuristic take on family transport that instantly makes almost everything else in this sector look dull and derivative. We liked it back at this model's original launch in 2014, and we still think this grand Super Picasso to be an eye-catching thing. Obviously, Citroen does too, for the French maker hasn't made many aesthetic changes as part of this facelift. There's a smaller, lower grille surrounding the number plate, and you get extra chrome trim around these high-set daytime running lights. Plush models like this one also get more chrome in a U-shaped strip around the lower fog lamps, plus smart aluminium-style side profile trimming along with integrated roof bars. Otherwise, things are much as before, with a distinctive three-tiered light signature and a windscreen that flows right up into the roof line. This seven-seater Grand C4 Picasso model does, of course, share plenty with its more compact five-seat C4 Picasso stablemate, though not quite as much as you might expect. Citroen claims, in fact, that only four main body parts are carried over between the two cars. As you'd expect, most of the design differences that set this lengthened, grand version apart are to be found at the back, where the wheels have been moved rearwards by 55 millimetres and a lengthened roof uh, taller profile windows and longer rear doors make it easier to use the extra two boot mounted fold out seats. I also really like the signature profile flourish found in the way this contrasting roof rail flows from front to back before curling artfully around the rear window to highlight the spacious glassy look. Moving round to the back, the Grand C4 Picasso body shape gets unique rear tail lights that on a top variant like this one have distinctive 3D illumination. Unfortunately, as with the ordinary C4 Picasso, they're mounted actually on the clamshell style tailgate, making it rather heavy to lift. That makes the powered tailgate option we have here quite desirable, a feature that's now operable with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper if you approach your Citroen laden down with bags. Now with the hatch raised, unfortunately the electric operation is tediously slow, you'll be able to access a cargo area that can be one of the very biggest in the class, though not, it must be said, when all seven seats are in use. That's a seating layout that'll leave you a relatively compact amount of stowage space to play with, just 165 litres. Still, that's more than competitors like Vauxhall's Zafira Tura, Volkswagen's Turan, Ford's C-Max or Toyota's Verso can offer with the seats in this configuration. The restricted luggage space with all the seats in use won't regularly be an issue for most likely buyers, given that much of the time they'll be using this car with the third row chairs folded into the floor. Now, if you do that, you'll find that no other compact seven-seat MPV can match what is the widest cargo area in the segment, stretching 1.17 metres between the wheel arches. Upper spec models also have nice touches like this removable torch. With all three sliding middle row chairs pushed right back, there's 632 litres on offer. Push them all forward and that figure rises to 793 litres. To give you a bit of perspective, that's nearly double the amount of space you get in, say, a Kia Karens or a Toyota Verso with five seats in use. So no, not all compact seven-seat MPVs are the same. It'll really pay you to do your homework when it comes to practicality. Where this Citroen spaciousness really is impressive, though, is when you're able to fold both second and third row seating and use all the luggage space it can offer, a full 2,181 litres. That's a figure you won't be able to better in a seven-seat MPV unless you get something based on a van or pay significantly more for a slightly bigger class of people carrier. All Grand C4 Picasso models also feature a fold-flat front passenger seat for longer items, allowing a load length of up to 2.5 metres, enough for something like a kayak. Again, I need to put this showing into perspective. In total capacity terms, we're talking nearly 20% more than is offered by a Vauxhall Zafira Tura, around 30% more than you get in a Kia Karens, and over double what you get in a Toyota Verso. Time to move up front. Get yourself behind the wheel, and probably the first thing your Citroen salesperson will show you is this panoramic windscreen. Push up this visor, 
and your normal upward 28 degree angle of vision is increased to a massive 108 degrees. It's a better view out, in fact, than you'd get roofed down in a convertible where the windscreen rail is usually directly above your head. Practically, it means you don't have to crane your neck up when, for example, you're first in the queue at the traffic lights. Subjectively, it does wonders in increasing the light, airy feeling of the cabin, something further aided by these front quarter lights. If you really don't like this arrangement, then you can pull the sun visor back down again to the point where the top of the roof would normally be. And that's just the start of the contemporary cleverness. Designer Frederick Subaru describes the interior as being inspired by contemporary loft-style living. It's uncompromisingly modern, airy, and there are a few touches that are quite extravagantly designed, like the optional relax front passenger seat, this one, that lets the occupant raise, stretch, and rest their legs. The days of Citroën's feeling built down to a price with all the design flair of a buffet car cheese sandwich are thankfully consigned to the past. Compare this cabin to that of, say, an old Zara Picasso, and you'd never believe they came from the same manufacturer. The dashboard is dominated by these twin screens. Now, most new cars have some sort of central infotainment screen these days, like this Citroën's tablet-style 7-inch touch drive interface lower display. But more unusual is this snazzily futuristic 12-inch panoramic HD panel up top, which replaces the normal set of conventional dialed instrument gauges. Unfortunately, this feature isn't standard on entry-level spec variants, but if you're buying this car, do try and stretch up to a trim level that has it, for this is one of the defining parts of this high-tech design. This top screen is primarily there to show a virtual speedometer, but it can also be configured to display all sorts of information, such as cruise control and speed limiter settings. Plus, there are various split screen options if, for example, you want to view navigation instructions at the same time as trip computer and speedo readouts. If you want to, you can change the screen's overall theme and upload a picture from a USB stick as a backdrop. As for the lower 7-inch touch drive interface screen, well, at least this is standard on every model. We still don't like the fact that you have to use it to operate the air conditioning and ventilation systems, but otherwise there's not much not to like about a setup that's certainly been improved as part of the mid-term revisions, though sometimes it's a bit slow to respond. It uh, includes a mirror screen feature that allows you to duplicate your smartphone's display onto the monitor via either uh, the Apple CarPlay or the MirrorLink Android systems. Plus, you can activate compatible apps like Parkopedia, Fuel, Weather Crave, and Rock Scout. Most models also get an upgraded navigation system too. Uh, the Citroen Connect Nav setup, cleverer in that the screen recognizes a wider variety of contact points so you can pinch and swipe as you would do on a smartphone or use voice recognition if that's easier. The Connect Nav system can read your emails and text messages audibly to you and there's also TomTom -tom mapping data with real-time traffic information, local weather forecasts and information on car parks and petrol stations. Plus, you can do local point of interest searches via the internet. It's all very 21st century. There's more to the cabin than just those screens, though. You'll need a bit of time to get used to the steering wheel, which, somewhat ironically, given the clean, open feel of the dash, is festooned with buttons. Still, it's nicely made and is surrounded by an interior fashioned from some really high-quality materials. As for cabin storage, well, to be frank, that could be a bit better. The glove box is mostly taken up by the fuse box. There's nowhere to store your sunglasses. The twin cup holders in front of the gear stick are very small, and the lidded box at the base of the centre stack that houses the various connectivity points isn't as big as it looks. On the plus side, you get a deep box with a sliding lid behind the gear lever that can be removed completely on automatic models. There are useful underseat drawers, and these front seat armrests give a captain's chair type feel. We also really like this optional rear facing conversation mirror, there to give an unimpeded view of which child has just stuffed its sticky sweet into your 12 volt socket. So, how will those children fare 
once they're installed rearwards and ready to plug their gaming equipment into one of the three 12 volt sockets scattered around the car. Well, pull open rear doors that open wide to a 65 degree angle for excellent access and it certainly looks pretty spacious. With comfort you can readily appreciate thanks to a proper seating arrangement. Unlike many people carriers, this one doesn't position the unfortunate middle rear passenger with legs astride a central transmission tunnel and perched on some hard and narrow piece of bulging foam. Instead, there's a completely flat floor and a rear cabin seating area made up of three separate, identically sized chairs, all with Isofix child seat mountings that can be reclined, uh, slid backwards and forwards independently of one another, or folded flat completely. That's really useful. Say you've got a small child on a booster seat in the back. You can push them forwards so that their needs are more accessible. The various seat folding options are helpful too. So, for example, if the middle seat's not in use, then it can serve as a table to serve the outer two passengers. Alternatively, if you're only using the middle seat, you might want to use the cinema-style feature on the outer two that enables the seat bases to be flipped up for extra floor storage. Talking of tables, these aircraft style fold out ones are built into the front seat backs as standard and if you want you can get them illuminated by neat LED lights as here. Kids toys or things you want to store away from prying eyes can be concealed in two neat underfloor compartments. Uh, there are also dedicated cabin vents on each side of the car. If you want the cabin to feel a little more airy, there's the option of a huge panoramic glass roof that ups the combined glazed area to a greenhouse like 5.7 square meters. Want more privacy? No problem. You can specify dark tinted rear windows and these integrated retractable rear side window sun blinds if you want to. Finally, a word or two about the feature that sets this grand C4 Picasso apart from its five-seater showroom stablemate, the third seating row. This is certainly easier to get to than it was on the pre-2014 first-generation model, thanks to a neat one-handed easy entry system. Get yourself seated and there are pluses and minuses. The dedicated air vents, climate buttons and cup holders are nice. Um, Citroen reckons that it's class-leadingly spacious back here, but that still doesn't mean it'll be especially comfortable for two tall adults on a long trip. Having said that, we need to be fair about this. No compact MPV of just 4.6 metres in length is going to be able to offer that. On the plus side, the fact that the second seating row has the widest sliding range in the segment means that if you are travelling 7-up, it'll be easier to tailor the cabin to the needs and heights of your various occupants. Citroen expects the majority of its C4 Picasso sales to be of this seven-seater grand model rather than the standard five-seat version, and you can see why. The premium for the extra seating row is only £1,700, an outlay that gets you a considerable amount of extra family flexibility. That leaves grand C4 Picasso pricing pitched from around £22,000 to just under £30,000, with most sales likely to be in the £23,000 to £25,000 segment. That's the kind of money most buyers of compact seven-seat MPVs shell out in this country. Now, transmission will be a key consideration for likely buyers, and those who avoid the entry-level diesel variant will be offered the option of Citroen's efficient EAT6 auto unit at a premium of £1,350. Previously, at the very bottom of the range with this body style, buyers were stuck with a 1.6-litre VTI petrol power plant that was so old-tech and relatively thirsty that it was virtually mandatory to find the extra £1,000 necessary to move up to the base diesel. Thanks to the introduction of 1.2-litre three-cylinder PureTech petrol technology, though, that's no longer the case. And for low-mileage buyers, the green pump fueled unit could well now represent a better choice. Now, with this seven-seat body style, you only get this engine in 130 brake horsepower form. 
Most Grand C4 Picasso customers, though, will continue to want to find the extra for one of the blue HDI diesels. Prices start from around £22,500, and there's a premium of around £750 to go from the base blue HDI 100 unit to a mid-range blue HDI 120 variant that's more relaxed, courtesy of its extra torque and six-speed gearbox. Now, both engines are 1.6 litres in capacity. There's a big price jump to make if you want to move up to the 2-litre blue HDI 150 variant, priced from around £26,000. So, having talked you through the range, let's talk you through the value proposition it offers, which is where it's important to know exactly what you want and compare like with like. First, a few simple observations. If you're going to be carrying seven adults on a regular basis, this category of compact seven-seat MPV won't suit. You'll need a full-sized, large sector MPV from the next class up, something from the Ford Galaxy Volkswagen Charan segment, where new model prices sit mainly in the 25 to 30,000 pound bracket. Or maybe something even bigger, like Citroen's own Space Tourer, a van-based MPV priced between £28,000 and £35,000 and able to seat up to nine people. That's the kind of money you'll also generally be paying for the smallest breed of seven-seat SUV. Vehicles like Mitsubishi's Outlander, Hyundai's Santa Fe and Kia's Sorento, though the third row here will be much more cramped. With that established, I now also need to point out that some seven-seat compact MPVs are bigger than others. The ones that, unlike the Citroen, don't also come in a shorter five-seat size tend to be slightly smaller and more restricted inside because they're, they're trying to be all things to all people. Not too long for the five-seater crowd, but just spacious enough to suit the seven-seat set. To explain what I mean, I'll use potentially comparable seven-seat compact MPVs like Kia's Karens, Toyota's Verso and Volkswagen's Turan as examples. The Karens and the Turan measure in at around 70 millimetres shorter than the Citroen, while a Verso is fully 130 millimetres shorter. Now those differences might not sound too great, but they actually make a significant impact on the amount of space third row occupants get. Take your family with you on the test drive, fold out all the seats and try before you buy, is my advice. Price-wise, the Verso and the Karens would save you around £1,500 to £2,000 over this C4, but you'd lose a lot of that saving during your time of ownership because both those MPVs cost more to run and depreciate faster. The Turan is better in all these respects, but costs more to buy, uh, around £1,500 more than the Citroen if you're looking at a comparable diesel. Two better matches for this car, we think, lie in Renault's Grand Scenic and Vauxhall's Zafira Tura. Both models significantly updated in recent times. The Vauxhall would cost you a little less than this Citroen to buy, but costs quite a lot more to run. The Renault gets closer to this C4's exemplary running costs, in diesel form anyway, uh, but costs a little more to buy. And both these two rivals have less space inside than this Grand Picasso, which is surprising in the Vauxhall's case, as that car is 54 millimetres longer in length. What else is there in terms of alternatives in this segment? A van-based MPV like Ford's Toneo Connect, uh, Fiat's Doblo or Citroen's own Berlingo Martus Bus? Well, that'd certainly be spacious and cheap, but if you're attracted by the avant-garde looks of this Grand C4 Picasso, you probably won't want anything as clunky and utilitarian as that. In terms of more realistic MPV rivals, well, in previous years, we'd have cited Ford's S-Max as a possible competitor for this car. But in second-generation form, the S-Max's pricing has been raised substantially to the point where you'll be looking at having to pay around £3,000 more than Citroen is asking here. And in return from your Ford dealership, getting yourself an MPV that doesn't really offer that much more space. Ford now promotes its Grand C-Max model as a closer match to this Citroen, and that people carry is indeed priced comparably against this C4. Unfortunately, though, for Ford, it offers significantly less luggage space than you get from a Grand C4 Picasso. To give you just one pertinent stat, a Grand C-Max has 100 litres less space than this Citroen when all three rows of seats are in use. That's quite a difference. You can see then that however you cut it, this Citroen looks a strong prospect for the right kind of buyer. 
So, if you are that person, what can you expect to find included within the standard equipment tally? Well, quite a lot, actually. All models get distinctively practical grand C4 Picasso touches like the clever panoramic windscreen and a fold-flat passenger seat, plus useful features like underfloor storage compartments, aircraft-style tray tables, underseat drawers at the front and armrests for the front seats. Other equipment items fitted right across the range include smart alloy wheels of at least 16 inches in size, LED daytime running lights, auto headlamps and wipers, rear parking sensors, power folding mirrors, a neat rechargeable boot torch and a parametric and volumetric alarm. Inside there's dual zone air conditioning with a pollen filter, a stitched leather multifunction steering wheel, aux in USB and 12 volt sockets, plus cruise control with a speed limiter. Below the unusual central LCD instrument display, you also get a 7-inch touch drive centre dash infotainment touchscreen, your access point for Bluetooth phone compatibility and the six-speaker DAB stereo system. Unfortunately, you've to stretch beyond base touch spec to get the features that we think really set this C4 Picasso apart in its market segment. Go for mid-range feel trim, though, and you can have them. A standard at this level, as well as niceties like a navigation system, front fog lamps and front parking sensors, you get the 12-inch panoramic HD colour central instrument display that for us is really a key part of the interior's futuristic appeal. Plus there's the option of adding in a relaxed front passenger seat that gives you an electric footrest, a massage function and a beautifully soft enveloping headrest. Passengering in a Grand C4 Picasso fitted with the relaxed package is like travelling first class in a 747. At the priciest end of the range, flagship flare variants like this one include that relaxed package as standard, as well as extending some of its luxury to the driver too. At this top level, your C4 Picasso will also come with these larger 18-inch alloy wheels, plus a huge panoramic glass roof, a reversing camera, a park assist system that steers you into spaces, rear privacy glass, 3D effect LED rear tail lamps, a keyless entry and start system, and a powered tailgate you can open with a wave of your foot if you're approaching the car laden down with bags. Plus, there are rear side window sun blinds, along with what is possibly our favourite touch, a rear seat conversation mirror that helps you keep a better eye on the kids in the back. On to extra cost options you could consider adding to your Grand C4 Picasso. Metallic paint is available of course, plus a lovely lustrous onyx black paint finish if you want something that will really stand out. Half leather or full leather upholstery packages are also available along with xenon headlamps, a 360 degree camera system and practicalities like a demountable tow bar and the usual roof racks and storage systems for bikes, skis, snowboards and roof boxes. Bear in mind too that if you go for a basic level of standard spec, you can add in many of the nicer features you might want as individual options. Though it's better first to consider having what you want bundled up as part of one of the various optional packs that Citroen offers. And we'll cover these now. You can have the child observation mirror and the rear side window blinds I mentioned earlier if you go for the inexpensive kids pack that many Grand C4 Picasso buyers specify. If you've got more to spend though, bear in mind that these two items also feature in a convenience pack for base touch spec models that additionally includes navigation and keyless entry, so you might prefer to go for that. Alternatively, if luxury and aesthetics matter more, you can also add in a style pack. On a base touch variant, this includes 17 inch wheels, dark tinted glass, the panoramic roof and aluminium style side profile trimming with integrated roof bars. Get your style pack on a mid-spec feel model and the wheel rims are 18 inch in size plus as well as the features just mentioned you get LED technology for the rear lamps and front indicators too. At that mid-spec feel level there's also the option of a feel convenience pack that gives you a powered tailgate, the park assist system active radar guided cruise control and an auto dimming rear view mirror plus additionally includes four key electronic safety items too an active lane departure warning system 
that stops you from drifting out of the, your, your lane on the highway. A blind spot monitoring system stops you from dangerously pulling out to overtake. An active seatbelt safety system uses Mercedes-style seatbelts that pull back automatically when you buckle up to optimise protection. And intelligent beam headlamps that automatically dip themselves in the face of oncoming traffic at night. If all you really want are extra electronic safety features like those, then your Citroen dealer will direct you instead to one of the optional driver assistance packages. There are two, and both come with the lane departure, blind spot monitor and intelligent beam systems just mentioned, as well as also including an electrochrome rear view mirror, a driver attention alert feature that prompts you if you seem to be getting drowsy, and a speed limit recognition system that pitches road signs as you pass, then displays them on the dash. We'd be tempted, though, to upgrade to the pricier driver assistance package 2 because it includes three further electronic safety features we'd really want. Active radar cruise control will automatically keep you a safe distance behind the car in front at highway speeds, speeding you up or slowing you down to suit traffic conditions. An emergency collision alert system alerts you if you're getting too close to the car in front. And an active safety brake setup scans the road ahead for potential accidents as you drive. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Having tried most of this stuff, we'll tell you that the radar-guided active cruise control works well, but is fiddly to activate. Uh, setup requiring use of the steering wheel buttons, manipulation of the infotainment touchscreen, and attention on the top digital display. The active lane departure warning system, meanwhile, uses a vibrating mechanism that buzzes the seatbelt against you when your wheels stray over the lane delineating lines without you indicating. It's rather irritating, actually, but maybe that's just the point. We'll finish by covering off the standard safety features common to all Grand C4 Picasso models. As you'd expect, there are twin front, side and curtain airbags, plus Isofix child seat fastenings on all three rear seats in the middle. To try and keep these things from ever being necessary, there are the usual electronic assistance features, including traction and stability control, plus ABS brakes with brake assist for emergency stops. It all accounts for a five-star Euro NCAP safety rating and an 89% score in the testing program's child occupant category. As we touched upon earlier, on-the-limit handling won't be a priority for MPV buyers, but three other issues most certainly are. Practicality, safety and cost of ownership. The first two areas are well covered by this car, but does it stack up on the balance sheet? When this second generation Grand C4 Picasso model was first launched back in 2014, Citroen went back to basics to try and ensure that it did, improving the aerodynamics, adding in stop and start engine technology, and most significantly, using a more modern EMP2 chassis that saved 140 kilograms of weight. Now that last change was somehow uh, enough to make this big seven seat MPV lighter than the brand's smaller super mini sized C3 Picasso model. Having done all of this, it was rather a pity that from launch, this car was saddled with a rather Altec range of 1.6 litre engines, the VTI petrol and EHDI diesel units that most customers chose, being a little off the pace in this segment when it came to efficiency. The VTI was particularly bad, struggling to crack 45 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and putting out nearly 150 grams per kilometre of CO2. But forget all of that now though, because the Grand C4 Picasso's mainstream power plants have transformed themselves when it comes to providing frugal running costs. Take the 1.2 litre three-cylinder PureTech petrol model. This 130 brake horsepower variant delivers 56.5 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and around 115 grams per kilometre of CO2, with no real downside if you order this model with the EAT6 auto transmission. That means your Grand C4 Picasso will qualify for road tax band C, which costs £30 a year. If you prefer blue HGI diesel power, you're looking at 74.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and around 100 grams per kilometre of CO2 for the 100 brake horsepower model. 
or 70.6 miles to the gallon and around 105 grams per kilometre if you go for the 120 brake horsepower version we're trying here. So, how have Citroen's engineers achieved such big efficiency gains? With the PureTech petrol models, the answer lies in lighter weight and a 30% reduction in mechanical losses that are due to friction. As for the PSA Group's Blue HDI diesel technology, well, the concept here is based around a clever three-step after-treatment system designed to better eliminate the four nasty pollutants that diesel units usually put out, namely unburnt hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides and particulates. The first stage sees the unwanted hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide elements converted into harmless water and carbon dioxide. In the second stage, that nasty nitrogen oxide also gets converted into water via a selective catalytic reduction process using a urea and water mixture called AdBlue. That's something that you'll have to get topped up every 12,500 miles. Finally, in the third step, a particulate emissions filter eliminates virtually all particulates at a stroke. The result of all this is industry-leading diesel technology that many manufacturers are struggling to copy. The only Blue HDI engine that was fitted to this second generation C4 Picasso model at its original launch was the 2 litre 150 brake horsepower unit, an engine which of course continues on in this facelifted range. It manages 68.9 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 107 grams per kilometre of CO2, placing this derivative in road tax band B, which means an annual road tax bill of just £20. Those fuel and CO2 figures fall to 65.7 miles to the gallon and 112 grams per kilometre if you go for the EAT6 auto gearbox that many potential buyers will want. That's still pretty impressive though for a vehicle of this size. The figures just quoted assume the fitment of 17 inch wheels. Go for the 18 inch rims we're trying here and you'll inevitably affect your returns by a few percentage points. What else? Well, those weight-saving measures also reduce wear on other consumables, including tyres and brake pads, all of which adds to the other measures Citroen has put into place to try and reduce maintenance costs. At this Mark II model's original launch, suspension tweaks claim to be able to increase tyre life by 20%, while redesigned brakes aim to preserve the brake pads for 40% longer. Another thing that could help you keep garage costs in check is the affordable three-year servicing plan that's available at point of purchase. Servicing intervals are every year or every 20,000 miles for the petrol models or the 2-litre diesel, or every year uh, or every 16,000 miles for the 1.6-litre diesels. On to residual values. Spec your car properly and these should be quite strong. Buyers in the used market will favour manual diesel models fitted with the 12-inch panoramic HD colour central display. You can expect a Grand C4 Picasso model of this sort to be worth around 40% of what you originally paid for it at the end of a typical three-year ownership term, which is significantly better than, say, uh, Vauxhall's Zafira Tura will manage, and very close to the kind of showing that you get from a more expensive rival like Volkswagen's Turan. We'll finish by briefing you on insurance. The PureTech 130 model is rated at Group 18E. The Blue HDI 100 diesel is rated at Group 17E, while the Blue HDI 120 sits at Group 20E. The 2-litre Blue HDI 150 is rated at either Group 25E or 26E, depending on the trim level you select. Finally, there's the usual Citroen 3-year 60,000-mile warranty. So, if you want a compact but spacious seven-seat MPV, look at the bigger pick. Is it that simple? Well, it depends upon your priorities, I suppose. There may be some buyers in this segment for whom ultimate driving dynamics dictate the choice of a Ford or a Vauxhall in this segment. I can only imagine these people to be in the minority, though. Most, in search of a modern people carrier, prioritise practicality, running costs and clever design. If, as here, they can have all of this with class-leading style and technology thrown in, then so much the better. This second-generation C4 Grand Picasso MPV developed this proposition, then further sharpened it with the well-judged package of revisions we've been reviewing here. 
in its original form, this Mark II model's futuristic looks always seemed a little out of kilter with the old tech petrol engines and rather basic levels of media connectivity provided. With all this now sorted, this C4 Picasso offers perfect proof that a people carrier can do more than just provide comfortable, efficient transport. It can be, well, what Citroëns once were, clever, futuristic, expressively designed, cars you'd be genuinely proud to own. I think you'd feel like that if you needed a model of this kind and this were on your driveway. True, it's a pity that you have to stretch to an up-spec trim level for all the features that show this car at its best, but if you can do that and tick all the right boxes, you'll get a people carrier that really seems to have been created with a bit of love, with an appealing mix of French flair and German solidity. From the panoramic windscreen to the lounge-style massaging passenger seat, from the widescreen HD instrument display to the fact that you can sit and Facebook your friends on the touchscreen, it's a car that's a joy to operate. And for me, a joy to look at, as different and refreshing in design as it will be to own. In short, the Citroen we used to know is back. The manufacturer that took risks, created magic and bought us cars that sat apart from the ordinary norm. If that sounds appealing and you're in the market for a model like this one, then we think you'll find a lot here that you'll like.